the Amash Project. here in Highgate for an extraordinary Amash researchers report. We're here catching Lloyd Pye. Thank goodness he's just in the UK for a week. Now, a month, a month. So right. he's got right. some conferences going, so I hope you see those. Anyway, I've heard that today is a very auspicious time. We have got Uranus conjunct the moon with Aries rising, or in Aries rising, I should say. So this means something special. So, Lloyd, thanks for being with us, taking the time out. Well, it's special just to be here with you. Oh, shucks. <laughs> okay, well, we're here to talk about the Star Child. Right. And the Star Child, for those people who don't know, is a skull, a real bone skull. Right. Perhaps you can fill us in on the very first history of it, the, the beginnings. The Star Child skull was found in about 1930 in Mexico uh -huh. by a young girl, teenage girl at the time, and she found it in a mine tunnel with another, there were two skeletons of which the Star Child was the head of one and a human, normal human was the head of the other. She recovered the two skulls, brought them back, kept them her whole life, assuming as anybody would in 1930 that the, the what she called the strange or bizarre looking one was uh, just a human deformity. And then they, they ended up giving the, when she was dying, she gave it to some friends to keep. They kept it for five years and gave it to some other friends. So just to go on a time frame, so how long did she have the skulls for not From knowing they were? about 1930 to about 1993 okay, or four so, when she died. So quite a time. Exactly. And then um, the, the couple that ended up with it, Ray and Melanie Young, uh -huh. Melanie was a neonatal nurse for about 15 years. And when she saw the skull itself and held it, much too light and it was much too symmetrical and she could see that all of the physical features that she could just see were not human-like just the the most basic things the eye sockets were different the brow ridges were different the nose was different the ears were in a different position it was missing an any and just everything she could see it had a crease in the top of the head yes. everything told her it wasn't a human deformity and it wasn't a human skull it was just too symmetrical too different too light Everything about it was wrong in terms of human. You've been involved in hominoid research, hominid research. No, I hominoid. Uh, hominoid. Right, Bigfoot and the abominable snowman, yeah. and I had also done a lot of human origins work relative to that. And so when they were asking around about okay. who in the field of alternative knowledge dealt with skulls, my yeah. name came up. They invited me to come to El Paso and take a look. Right. I did. My first reaction was that it probably was a deformity of some kind. But I told them it was very unusual, and I didn't know what kind of deformity yes. it might be. And had you seen anything remotely like this no, before? No, I never had. And so I began to take it to experts to see what they said, and it turned out they hadn't either. They, right. Nobody and these, really and these knew are what it was. your usual run-of-the-mill medics, and I don't well, mean that rudely. This would I mean, be, yeah, this would be doctors, and this would be very specialists. This would right. be anatomists. This would be archaeologists, anthrop well, anthropologists, not archaeologists, hmm. anthropologists, people who should know right. what they're looking at okay. and, and didn't. You know, okay. So that I was by the end of the year, I was convinced that right. it was something very special. So which year are we in at the moment? Ninety nine, early. Early ninety nine. I saw it in early okay. ninety nine, and by the end of ninety nine, I was pretty much convinced of what it was. And so, how did it come to be in your custody? Well, Ray and Melanie, they both had jobs, and they couldn't do anything with it. Right. And so they said, as you travel around, I was traveling around the country yeah. giving lectures. They said, as you travel around, would you just try to find out what it is yeah. from experts where you go? And I said, yeah, I will. And so I did. Yeah, Great stuff. And I have to say that... Um, I think we were saying it was about four years ago that you were in the UK and I attended one of your lectures and um, indeed you had the two facsimile skulls Right. and uh, I know that you have the precious ones locked away in, right. a, in a bank vault, don't you? Yeah. But what was really interesting about that is um, whilst they, they didn't look sort of hugely different in terms of size, I mean some difference, but it was the weight. Right. That was the phenomenal Actually, thing. Actually, they're, they're about physically the same size. Yeah. They're the size of a skull of, a, of about a five foot 
human or uh, about a 12 year old average yeah. person yeah and and also i i think you were saying there was something to do with the volume the capacity right. of the brain in this other skull right. let's say um in in the human skull of that size mm -hmm. like as you and i sit here mm -hmm. we have about 1400 cubic centimeters of brain in our heads an average person has about 1400 cubic right. centimeters a very small person around five feet tall is going to have more like 1200 cubic centimeters right. it's just a size thing the star child is the size of uh, a head that should have should have 1200 cubic centimeters the human that it was found with she does have 1200 cubic centimeters but the star child when you measure its brain volume the same way you turn it upside down you pour seed bird seed in mm -hmm. and pour it out and measure yeah. the amount it's one third more. Wow, it's I mean that's 1, huge. 1,600 cubic centimeters. Wow. It's 200 more than you and me. Yeah. From 1,200 to 1,600 is a huge jump in the same capacity. So when that was done, the brain guy was like, I don't know how this happened. Yeah. I don't know how this could happen. Yeah. Well, some of the ways where the extra um, would come is that the star child has no frontal sinuses. It right. has very shallow eye sockets. But, and it has expanded parietals, and the bone is much thinner. But on the other hand, it also has a flattened rear of its head, so that would take away some. So the bottom line is, we don't really understand it. It's almost like magic. Yes. It's almost like magic. And you were saying, it has. yeah, sorry to interrupt, but you were saying that the, that the skull itself, although it's much thinner, it's twice as durable. Two or three times. It's yeah. very, very hard. I've, I've cut it, and about five other people have cut it, and we all say the same thing. It's just incredibly hard to cut relative to the bone and a human bone if the human bone is about like this yeah. the star child is about like that it's yeah. just less than half right and yet when you try to cut it it's like trying to cut sheet metal it's very very hard and what's the composition of that have you found that out now yeah the star child bone is more like tooth enamel which is the hardest bone in our body yeah. it, it's its biochemistry is that of tooth enamel the whole bone the yeah. all of it so yeah. that adds a lot to its hardness but also there are fibers woven through the matrix of that bone like rebar through concrete these fibers add they're very durable they add to the to the toughness of it and uh, we we really are amazed because there's no other bone on earth that has those fibers woven through the bone so the star child is unique in that regard right and um, what is the dating on on both skulls as far as both, you know both skulls we did we see 14 them carbon 14 them dated mm -hmm. and and both of them died about 900 years ago plus yeah. or minus 40 years so uh, right at 900 years ago yeah. they died do we know if there's any relationship between the two of the uh, no, there is, we know for sure there is no genetic relationship right. between the two of them. Right. They're not, they're not mother, child, nothing. We thought that might be the case yeah. for a while, but uh, genetics prove that it isn't the case. Yeah, and also um, now we, we believe that the star child in, is in fact a misnomer. Well, we know the star child is a misnomer. Right. It's a star adult. Right. We, but the first week we had it, the first week we had it, the very first test we had done was an x-ray of just the parts yeah. to see if there was anything unusual. And in the piece of maxilla, this this piece right here, uh -huh. the technician saw that there were two teeth still present, like oh, down okay. and present, and there were uh, five uh, crowns, parts up here, wow. unerupted. And so he said, oh, well, you look at this and you see teeth down, you see teeth up, that's got to be a child five, six, seven years old. Yes. And so we said, you know, yeah. assuming it was human-like, and so we said, all right, well, mm -hmm. we'll call it the star child. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake because it's a star adult. Right. So I know that you've been through some genetic testing with it. Can you give us a little bit of the history of, of that, how that's progressed? Well, the, the first test was in 99, and that was by a forensic lab in Canada that was not capable of, of really researching ancient DNA. Right. Any, any DNA older than 50 years is called ancient, and, yeah. re and it requires very much different handling than would my, my DNA or your DNA, fresh right. DNA, yeah. that's pretty easy to work with. But when you start working with material 50 years or older, it's very degraded over right. time and it's very contaminated by the bacteria of death and the bacteria in the soil sure. where it's buried and stuff yeah. like that. So it, that special handling makes it much more difficult and much fewer labs can do it. And I guess contamination can be a problem as well. Yeah, it just, yeah. just human contamination of those working on it if they don't take the proper precautions. And this lab, that the, the only, <clears throat> the, excuse me, the six labs in the world that could do this kind of testing in 99 wouldn't 
wouldn't do the star child. They just wouldn't touch anything like that. Now that's an interesting thing yeah, in itself, yeah, isn't yeah. it? So um, we had we the only one that would do it was this forensic teaching lab at the university at a university in Canada, Vancouver, and uh, they but they were kids doing it. It was right. adults overseeing it, but, yeah. but kids were doing the work, and there was just contamination. So they made they made an assessment of it, but it was a mistake. Then in 2003, we had another test by a lab of, uh, that was capable of, uh, of, of analyzing ancient DNA properly, and that lab showed that the 99 test was absolutely invalid. Right. Now, you can still read the results of that 99 test on the Internet as the bottom line because that test said that the star child was human and that's it, forget about it. Yeah. And that's what mainstream science wants to believe. Yeah. And so that, unfortunately, is what anybody goes out looking for more information about it finds out. You never hear about anything that's happened since. They want to believe that, that's what they believe, and that's all that they put out on, on Wikipedia and any of the other yeah. sources of criticism that are out there. It's generally based around that first yeah. 99 DNA test, which was just completely wrong. And also, it's just the fact, isn't it, that the, the genetics testing uh, ability or technology has just changed vastly in the last few that, years, in the last 99, five years. 99 was the stone age of DNA testing right. compared to where we are now. Yeah. We're like... You know, we've taken a ride in the Millennium Falcon forward. We really have. I mean, from using 20 to 30 base pair primers at that time and, and even later, we are now up to being able to recover base pair by base pair by base pair, which is just absolutely astounding information that you can pull from any genome yeah. now, yeah. from absolutely anything. Even an alien genome, if it's got base pairs, it, they can be recovered and they will be recovered. Yeah. And in the case of the star child, they are being recovered. Yeah, yeah. We, you were talking earlier on, too, about the three different aspects that are always uh, used for debunking the star child right. skull, as it's become known. Right. So can you take us through those? Well, the things that you'll read when you, when you look at people trying you know, this is on the internet, the trolls sure. and the people, who, the critics and the sure, skeptics the who do that. Right. Mm. Uh, yeah. They will say that it's cradle boarded right. to, to account for the flatness of the rear of the head, that it's got hydrocephaly, which accounts for the swelling in the parietals, yeah. or that it's got progeria to account for the thin bone and the very small lower face. Yeah. And, and all of those are outwardly just, you know, symptomatic of those of those issues sure. but when you look at the truth of what what cradle boarding is about cradle yeah. boarding if it really was if r cradle boarding had really made that flatness at the rear of the head the bone itself would be as flat as the board that the that the And also would be there's an angle on. issue there though isn't yeah. there and there yeah. there's that too that if you uh, you know if you cradle boarded an infant like the star child because of the angle the, the steep tilt of its head you would have to bend it down so tight that it would strangle. It, it. it couldn't live yeah. at that angle. Yeah. So, I mean, no mother in the world would have done that. No. But more importantly, the bone itself flattens because child infant bone is so soft. So it really does flatten. And the star child has all of its natural convolutions. It, it's just clear to anybody. I mean, as I say in my presentation, it's morons could see. Yeah. The, the, the stupidest person can see. So mainstream scientists can't see. But anybody else without a PhD after their name can very easily see that's impossible. But also another point about that, just to, just to really wrap that point up, is that it doesn't add volume. It, it, you know, exactly. I mean, excuse me. I, well, but then <laughs> as far as the hydrocephaly goes, you know, you could have, you could have with the hydrocephaly, uh, you, you know, a bit of an explanation maybe, but when mm. you start looking at the facts, there is no way that the star child is a hydrocephalic because all of its sutures are, are fused together as yes. they should. Yeah. The, star, the, the hydrocephaly pulls everything apart with the pressure, yeah. and, and it, they never get to fuse, yeah. never get to fuse. And the star child is perfectly fused, so that's one thing there. And with, with hydrocephalics, they, you know, the, the, the fluid blows up like a balloon. It's like yeah. blowing a balloon. It's just yeah, pressure, yeah, yeah. pressure, pressure. It, it grows all around. And yet the star child has these two lobes here with a nice crease down the mm -hmm. middle of them. Mm -hmm. You cannot blow up a balloon and leave yeah. a crease in it unless you put a piece of tape or something on it, yeah. uh, which would be like, you know, fusing the sutures, and the star yeah. child just doesn't have that. There's no way this star child is, is hydrocephalic. And with as the, far as progeria, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, I was one, say about that. progeria mm -hmm. is that, that horrible disease 
disease where mm-hmm. a child is born and immediately starts aging yes. and it ages prematurely yeah. and they become very fragile and they generally die by the age of 15 and that's mm-hmm. that's a long life for a yes. progeria victim and their bone thins out it does mm-hmm. and their face gets much smaller and much lower uh, much more reduced like the star child in both cases yes. but mm-hmm. whereas their bone becomes brittle and and will fracture very easily mm-hmm. like the bones of old people they're old people yeah, so they sure. they fracture very easily and they're very brittle the star child's bone while thin is two or three times as hard yeah. as normal yeah. human bone yeah. so it's clearly not a progeria victim yeah. but when you put the star child's skull against the face of a progeria victim you see very clearly a progeria victim still has all of their human parts yeah. intact nothing changes there they just are old but the star child has no no human features at all. It has 25 major physical differences, major physical differences, and not a single point of reference on either your skull or my mm-hmm. skull. Can you find an exact match on mm-hmm. the star child? This isn't going to happen. So in all of those cases, they're just making up excuses to try to explain away the star child yeah. for people who won't bother to take the time to look at the facts. But in fact, all of those hi, uh, um, cradle boarding, hydrocephaly, and progeria are just flatly wrong, and anybody that looks at the facts can see that. It's just simply not true. No defect and no combination of defects cause the star child. Mm-hmm. Genetics cause the star child to look like it does. And what's interesting about the star child skull, again, in comparison to a human one, is this issue with the sinuses as well as the eye socket depth. Right. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that because that, that's huge. Well, just simple things between the star child and a human. All humans have frontal sinuses behind here. Star child doesn't have a sign of a, just no even vestige of a sinus. Now you were relating that to communication, weren't you? Right. Physical communication. Right. You, your, your sinuses are part of our, our speaking mechanism and without it our voice would sound very tinny yeah. and hollow because there's no resonance. And so the star child without those sinuses would either have a voice of very unusual quality or just doesn't doesn't speak and that's yeah. always a possibility yeah. but even something simple like our brow ridges all humans mm-hmm. have brow ridges yeah. to okay. some degree yeah. or other right mm-hmm. a little bit of a bump and you can see it exaggerated in primates like chimps and gorillas and things sure. like that the star child has nothing it's absolutely flat just absolutely flat not the first it goes right into the eye sockets and it makes an edge instead of a mm. round like an eye. It's just totally different. Yeah. And then our noses, when we come down, we all have a dip have like you profile. have a dip, yeah. like I have a dip. Mm. It comes down off the brow ridge, a little dip down into where the bone starts. The star child is absolutely flat, just like here, just flat, yeah. flat, no dip. And the nose is wide, you know, like ours starts out narrow and flares out a bit. Sure. It starts out at a certain width and it stays that way for oh, what right. we have all right. the way down. Completely different. Yeah. Completely and different. And the depth of the eye socket, is it two inches in a human normally? Mm-hmm. And I can't remember what the star chart is. Half, I mean, that's. Right. Like 25% of what we have, it has. Its yeah. eye socket is extremely shallow, but not only is the eye socket shallow, the foramens, the optic foramens, what, which bring the nerves and the blood in to control the eyeball, yeah. those have been moved, shoved down into the right. middle, so down to here, so yeah. that the if there's an eyeball kind of like ours, mm. instead of sitting where mm. ours sit, it's going to be down mm. closer to the middle of our nose. So be, yeah. imagine eyes down about a half a half an inch, yeah. and they're going to look. That's going to look kind of weird, but that's how the star child is going to yeah. be. And there are, there are some other differences as well, aren't there, in our in the makeup, <clears throat> sort of with the neck and the placing of that, right. and, and that, which is really fascinating. And, and again, it's very linked to, um, I, I guess we can call them degrees, aren't we? Since since we we've, we've talked it, about it um, looks like that it, within our it research. looks to everyone who knows anything about it and, and who has experienced any kind of uh, research about the, what are called gray aliens. Yeah, it has all the physical hallmarks of what people describe grays as having. They say when they see grays, they say that they have this expanded parietal sphere that has a crease down the middle. The star child has that. And they describe it consistently as, well, they have kind of a heart-shaped face. They have Mm -hmm. like a heart and then narrow like this and down. The star child has all of that physicality to produce that heart-shaped face. So you take that skull and you put it in skin and muscle and all that. You're going to get a heart-shaped face out of that. And those eyes are very weird. Now, 
the the I can't standard, imagine what they'd be like actually. Yeah, the standard yeah. teardrop shape that people describe grays mm. having. That doesn't mean that's their eyes. That mm. could easily be lenses that they wear over to sure. see in either at night or whenever. Yeah. But those are in all likelihood those teardrop things are lenses and under there is an eye more like our eye because it does have some of the aspects of an eye like we have. It's just a much thinner eye. So when people talk about the grays, one of the things they talk about is they have these big black eyes, sure. right? Yeah. So if you've got an eye unlike ours, we have a big eye sitting behind the little opening. You mm -hmm. have a much bigger mm -hmm. eyeball, mm -hmm. and you have just that little aperture that sure. shows it. Well, all that bigness back there is to hold it in your head in the event of impacts and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at a very shallow half-inch eye socket, that's got to be looking out. It isn't. It can't be a ball like we have, yeah. or it'd be frog yeah. eyes, just two yeah. big frog eyes sticking off your mm -hmm. face. It isn't. That's too dangerous. That isn't going to work. So you're going to need a flattened out eye, but it isn't going to be able to move. It's mm -hmm. see, we see 180 degrees by flicking our eyes. Yeah. We have sure. muscles and mm -hmm. everything designed to do that. I think probably they have an eye that just sits there. But they have a 180 degree aperture in the in the iris, and they can just see 180 degrees mm -hmm. without moving their heads. Yeah. That's that's yeah. all I can imagine you would have with an eye like that, and that would explain the black eyes that everybody. Did they just say they're all black? Yeah. Well, if they're all iris, mm -hmm. if they're all taking in light and you mm -hmm. know, seeing, sure. That make to me that makes sense. I tell you what you were talking about earlier, which was interesting too. Um, we were just going on on the neck, uh, right. but before that, um, is the cerebellum. Right. You're talking about that, how that, it, am I right in thinking that doesn't seem to be apparent from what you've seen in the star child skull? The star child, uh, the, way, the, the way the star child head is set up, the way our head is set hmm. up, in the rear of our head, down at the base of it, our yeah, cerebellum sort of, sits yeah. in a curve. It sits so in the curve, yeah, back here. All right? Right, yeah. So it sits yeah. right there, and it has some, some uh, ridges in here that holds yeah. it in position so that yeah. it, it braces up for all of the rain that sits down on top of it. So it's got a nice, comfy, and this is some of the biggest, heaviest bone in the skull. So it's, it, the cerebellum is well protected, and the muscle, neck muscles sit right on top of it, too. It's very well protected. Well, with the star child, all this is flattened out mm. at a very steep angle, yeah. and those ridges inside are, are just taken out. So there's nothing really to support it. It's like it's like a, a you know a heavy kid on a slipper yeah. slide going down. So you would and and a lot of the extra brain is up here in the parietal. Mm -hmm. So what you'd have to assume is that that brain, if it was the consistency of our brain. It would just the weight of it and the angle would push it right out of the neck hole, right, the through, frame yeah. of magnum. And it would squeeze right out and yeah. kill the individual. Yeah. But that didn't happen with the star child. So when you look at it that way, it either doesn't have a cerebellum. Like Which is have. tell us about the cerebellum. Just, the cerebellum just is your software. It's, yeah. It runs you. You you think with this part of your brain, but the thing that runs you, that runs your autonomic nervous system, yeah. that runs your digestion, that runs your breathing, that runs the coursing of your blood through your body, all of that, that's the, your motor, and that's the cerebellum down here. Everything else up here for thinking and all that or whatever that's for, the cerebellum, you take it out, you're done for. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it makes you think if, so maybe that other 200 centimeters, cubic centimeters of brain, somehow they've got their cerebellum element somewhere else, not, not there. Yeah, they or, could, they, or, they, or they don't even have them. They, but, yeah. but the main thing, though, Joanne, about that, the brain is and the sliding mm. is, to keep that from happening, that brain, the star child's brain, has to be very much harder, made of a denser material, oh, a right. more, okay. more rubber-like or something, so that it can take the pressure and absorb it and not yeah. slide out. If it, if it was our brain and that head, that brain would have slid out and would have killed it. It didn't, so it doesn't have a brain like ours. It has a brain with more solid consistency. It has to, or it couldn't have lived. Yeah, and you're just thinking about sort of the neck position as well, you know, trying to imagine with that with that, the angle uh, and this well, with, tiny with the neck, opening. Uh, you know, with humans, because mm. our front of our face is hollow, we have these, the frontal sinuses taking up a lot of space, the depth of our eye soc sockets taking up a lot of space, yeah. our nasal passage is taking up a lot of space, it's all air, all light, our mouths taking up a lot of space. 
our necks are set back from dead center yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to yeah. balance out because mm -hmm. we have all this weight back here and all this lightness up here. The neck, the center point has to go back. It's mm -hmm. just simple math, you know, yes. simple physics. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just got to be that way. Mm -hmm. Well, with the star child, it doesn't have all this. It doesn't have frontal sinuses. It's very shallow eye sockets. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it's got a very small face, very small mouth, and it's got this big lump of brain back here at that tilted angle. So its center of balance its center, its center point of, of balance is pushed forward, dead under the head, so right. that you get a you get a, a, a weird looking golf ball on a golf tee. I mean, mm. that's how it's sitting, like yeah, a yeah, golf yeah. ball on a golf tee, mm. but it's just a weird shaped ball. But that's how it's sitting, on this little thin neck. Its neck is half the size of ours or less, and our neck is circular in shape, and its neck is oval. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, I hadn't realized that. Its neck that. is oval, so oh, it's got okay. a much thinner neck and a different shaped neck. But it's holding up a, a bigger head, yeah. you know, a, relatively speaking, a, a bigger yeah. head, and it and yet it's holding it up perfectly balanced. I mean, perfect in all four quadrants. It's perfectly balanced front and back. It's perfectly balanced side to side. And we're not. We use lateral muscles to control that. Sure. And we're not balanced front and back either. We're we're balanced to the back. I mean, we can mm, create balance, yeah, but we do yeah. it with muscles. They don't need to do that, yeah. so they have much less muscle and much less volume to their neck. Yeah. I mean, it really no, is. It a, does. The search all does. Yeah, yeah. That, it's just really intriguing. I just want to ask you too um, something that I've thought about before is the the cone heads of uh, I know they're of they're Peru. Yeah, of Peru particularly. Right. I know they're in other places in the world, but. Um, have you looked at them and see how they compare yes, at all? Yes, I work with Brian Forster, who's one of the top conehead researchers in the world, Brilliant. and, and uh, we're we're trying to get some DNA work done through our geneticist and you know the one who's working for us yeah. to do some work for him. And we've already had some results uh, for for one test with it that indicates that the coneheads are are different, more more hu more like human, but still very very different. Yes. but but. Uh, more like human than the star child, which is you know very different. But it's very very early stuff yet, yeah. and we can't we can't you know say much more than that. No. But the start the cone heads are interested. But the cone heads, what makes them so fascinating to me anyway, is that they have twice the brain in their heads that we do. Twice the I brain. I know. I was thinking about that. That was twenty eight hundred to three thousand <laughs> uh, cubic centimeters, and we have fourteen hundred. So it's like that. I have to wonder what and, they did. And yet, scientists, when they look at cone heads, what do they yeah. say? They say, "Oh, well, those heads were just bound. Those heads were just wrapped." Well, How nuts you take is that? a human baby <laughs> and you can you can reform the baby's head with Doesn't some change binding, the volume, though. but you don't change no. the volume exactly. <laughs> but the the cone heads have a human like face yeah. more than the star yeah, child do. does. Yeah. But they still have some very significant differences. They have differences in the jawline, in the way the jaw is set, the teeth are set different. The cone heads are something else. The yeah. cone heads are not entirely human. They look like they'd be really super tall as well. Do you think they would um, be? That we're not as sure of right. because okay. you have you have a spread of them and it's hard to know which are juveniles because the ju yeah. the, the kids seem to have full blown teeth. Oh wow! So there's okay. some unusual things about yeah. the cone heads that are going to come out as the research continues, and I believe that they're going to prove to be. Uh, not not entirely human either. The star child, we have no doubt. I yes. believe the cone heads at this point are also going to be not entirely human. Okay, so let's go on to your geneticist who's right. been on board with you since, is it a couple of years? I forget now. Uh, almost two, two, two years. Two yeah, years. Almost two years. And, th and this was a, a godsend of uh, a, of yeah, a, beyond of a that. find. Yeah, it really was. How, really. how did you come, or how did he come um, into your It's, it's research. really an interesting story. A woman uh, read the star child e-book, the star child oh, right, essentials yeah. e-book, yep. mm -hmm. and she she was friends, with, and she was a teacher at a school, and she was friends with this other teacher, and she got to talking about it, and she knew that her husband was a geneticist. And she mm -hmm. said, you know, I read this book, and, I, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but I think <laughs> this guy's right. I think they have, might have an alien skull there. And the wife of the geneticist says, really? No kidding. And she said, yeah. And she said, well, I'd like to read that. So she said, okay. And so mm -hmm. she, she got a copy of the book. And uh, and I remember the name. It was it was kind of an unusual name, and I remember that. And so the geneticist then she read it, and she told the geneticist, "You know, I know how this is going to sound, but I think you ought to read this. I think these guys, these people might have yeah. something." So he read it, and he said, "You know, they really might have something." Really, he was that open-minded. Yeah, he was that open-minded wow. about it. So he contacted me, and he said. I'm willing to do an initial run to see what you might have. He says, I can, wow. with the new generation of, of 
tech, of technology, I can tell you if you really have something and if your test of 203 is accurate about the, the um, being a hybrid and all of that. Yeah which at that time is what we still believed. Mm. Now, he didn't know what he was going to get into, so he did He did one run, shotgun run, got several dozen um, recovered fragments of hundreds of, of base pairs long out of the, um, the junk DNA of the Star Child's um, right. nuclear DNA. But when he sent it to the NIH lab to see kind of where it, where it fit in the scheme of life on Earth, about half of it found corollaries in human uh, DNA, but about half of it wasn't even found in the database. Can we just flag up what the NIH is for those uh, who may not know? I'm sorry. The NIH mm -hmm. is the National Institutes of Health in the States, mm -hmm. and they are the largest organizing body for paying for um, medical research, yeah. particularly genetic research. So if you're doing genetic research, you submit a grant to NIH, they give you the money, you, whatever you produce, you owe back to them as a result for them to add to their database. Yeah. You don't own it. They paid for it. They own it pretty much. Right. And so you send whatever information you get, the genetic information you get, back to them, and they load it into the database. So by two late, by mid to ten, when we were doing this for the mm -hmm. first time, for the very first time, there were literally billions, billions of coherent base pair strings in that database. So for half of the star childs to come back as having no corollaries, he said, you know, you really got something here. That's phenomenal, but He isn't says it? a few mm -hmm. of these coming back not registering, I, he says, I wouldn't mind that. But to have this much, this thing is absolutely unusual. So he says, I'm in if you're in, and, you know, let's see where we can go with it. Great. And here we are two years later on the verge of really doing some amazing things. That's fantastic. Just to go back to, you know, how, how you've been able to do this, we're, we're here at, um, in Highgate at the house of uh, Belinda McKenzie, who's a fantastic supporter of all uh, your work and mm -hmm. uh, many other uh, alternative orientated uh, right. researchers as well. And um, she plays a big, big part in the progress of the Star Child Skull. Right. And It'd be really nice just to hear See, that. Be Belinda McKenzie, um, in, in late 2002, mm -hmm. the, the first test that I told you about, in, in, in first DNA test in 99, the mainstream used that test to just hammer me down, to yeah. just tell everybody, you know, Lloyd Pye's a fool, Lloyd Pye's lying, Lloyd Pye's a huckster, don't believe anything he mm -hmm. says, a lab has already shown that it's a human, and that should be the end of it, and he should just quit and go home and give it up, and yeah. just, you know, it's all done, forget about him, forget about everything. And of course, people listen to scientists, when scientists are talking, people oh. listen. So, mm -hmm. in those three years, I just couldn't get an audience with hardly anybody. I, I couldn't get an audience with even, even uh, alternative people. I couldn't get I couldn't lecture hardly. It was it was so I couldn't make any money. I went into debt. I was going to have to go bankrupt. And my girlfriend of the time said, "Excuse me, you got a, <laughs> you got a oh, spider." You. I'm sorry. So <laughs> sorry. Um, so my girlfriend of the time said, "You just have to quit. You just have to give this up. This is killing you. This is wrecking your career. Mm -hmm. You still have another career you can go back to with yeah. the hominoids and human origins." And so I finally had to agree. So I sent the word out to my mailing list, which Belinda was on, sure. and I didn't know it. And I said to everybody, which at that time was about 2,500 people, and, and just out of the blue, she wrote back and she said, what would you need to keep going? And I said, I, I don't even know. I'm, I've yeah. been so far hopeless for so long, I don't even know anymore. Because I had stopped researching what I needed to do. And Anyway, so I said, but I can find out. And so she said, well, let me know when you find out. Well, it took me a few weeks of research uh, what, what uh, ancient DNA labs were available and what yeah. used to be six in 1999 were now 24. Oh, great. Yeah. So I had a much bigger choice, and some of them were new, brand new, and they needed business. So I contacted some of them, and one of them said, yes, we'll do it for X amount of money. Mm -hmm. So then I sent that X amount of money to Belinda, and I said, we need this, and I need this to live on to keep going. And she said, you know, she would check out, check me out, check out my credentials and, you know, see who I was and make yeah. sure that I wasn't just a hustler. And so I, I'm, I assume she hired a private detective or somebody to check me out. Uh, and, and a few weeks later, she said, OK, you, you check out 
and the check came, and I was back in business wow. in, in 2003, and then so I went right out and got those guys lined up, and by mid-2003, we had that, that second DNA test, and, you know, we were off to off and running, so that was it. How Belinda, amazing. Belinda saved the day. She raised yeah. the dead. Brilliant. Belinda McKenzie. Thank you. Belinda. As usual. <laughs> Brilliant. Hey. So we, just to really finish on this, the star child development side of things, right. on the genetics side, how far have we got? Where are we at to? We, are, we have now gone an amazing distance. We have all of those dozens of fragments out of the, the nuclear DNA, the junk DNA. We have a single fragment of what is called FOXP2 out of the non-junk DNA and this this one fragment of 211 base pairs is so compelling in what it shows us that it's like just it closes the case in our favor it's amazing we also have four fragments of mitochondrial DNA which right. in their own way also close the case in our favor and now we have a, a new little small piece of protein that is comes out of uh, the eye, a, a collagen piece that comes out of a very, very specific part of the eye, and it's very different than the human wow. eye. So everything that we've recovered so far that tells us anything about the star child versus a human, it indicates that the star child is radically different. It's like I said, the, the area code of a human is, is Earth, and the area code of the star child is the moon. It's that far apart. Wow. It's really, really amazing. That is, that is absolutely amazing. Can you just give us a little bit more on the Fox? Is it? Fox P2. P2, can you just well, in, give us a little background? The Fox P2, there are, in, in, in nuclear DNA, what, mm -hmm. what we have in our bodies that, that is the largest part of it, it's in our cells, 95% of that, 97% of that, you get different numbers doesn't work it's just junk or non-coding or whatever so there's only like about three percent of the three billion base pairs still a lot it's 90 million base pairs mm. but that runs our bodies that runs our bodies well in there there is a gene one of the genes called fox p2 that is part of creating a, a an embryo when we're forming, okay. Fox P2 is there from the first cell division, and what it does, it's called a master gene. There's only a few master genes that control the downflow of other genes. So Fox P2 controls about 300 or more other genes, so that if anything goes wrong in it, the the um, the embryo just dies. That's it. It can't go forward. You can have there are 2,495, I think, uh, base pairs, something like that, yeah. in the FOXP2 gene. If one of them, if one of those 2,000, if one is wrong, you you might be born, but you're going to have a very bad disorder from that. Just right. one. You can't have two. You can't have three. All of us who are normal, any normal human being. All of the FOXP2 gene uh, base pairs are exactly yeah. the same. Mine are the same as yours. Okay. Everybody else, everybody listening. If you're normal, you've got the same. Yeah. The star child has like 700 differences. If you extrapolate what out of that 211, where it has 56, if you extrapolate right. that out to 100 percent, it's got over 700 differences where a normal human would just have none. Right, and you were also, and also that I mean, that it really is uh, amazing when you give that, you know, run with that one. But what is it about? You were talking about there were 120 differences between humans, sort of it, generally. Well, that's the, that jumps to the oh, mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA. Yes, I wanted to get the, on that. With the mitochondrial Just DNA, humans, on. humans have a maximum of 120 variations in right. the. Mitochondrial DNA is 16,569 base right. pairs. 16,569. Okay. Of those, it is very highly conserved, like FOXP2, but it can have a little has a little more room to play with, you yeah. know, with variation and, and mutations. So humans have a maximum of 120 differences. 120. Neanderthal has 200. Right. The new the new uh, creature that's kind of like Neanderthal, Denisova, has 385 differences. So it's 120, 200, 385. Yeah. Star child, 800 to 1,000. Wow. So it's just a huge, huge difference. <laughs> Maybe it's further out than the moon. <laughs> Certainly is least as far as the moon. Certainly. Are there any other major factors for you that are 
that have come from this new genetic testing? That no, have... re really, the FOXP2 is just oh, yeah. so overwhelming. And, yeah. and, the, and the mitochondrial DNA, those two things alone, the, the little piece of the collagen 8 is very interesting, but it's not nearly as compelling as the other two. The other two are really slam dunk home runs. They really are. Yeah, because you actually had um, some teeth to work with as well, didn't you, I, I understand, which is, again, phenomenal to think that a, the star child had teeth. I had teeth. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I know you were talking about the, the eruptors before, but right. the fact that, you know, they've even been used, absolutely fantastic. Okay, at this point, I want to bring in Belinda. Belinda McKenzie, welcome to Amash. Mm -hmm. How wonderful to speak to you on camera at last. Mm -hmm. Belinda, you've done such fantastic work with, with so many, but I really want to focus on Lloyd at the moment because it was a pivotal time when you contacted him. And uh, just really interested to know what, what, what was it about the Star Child Skull that caught your attention? Well, I'd been watching in the wings, so to speak, like I believe many, many hundreds of thousands, possibly millions around the world, this um, unfolding of this project on, on um, the internet. Right. And um, chiefly reported on the David Icke website, as you would imagine yes. it would be, and thought that everything was going absolutely fine, and um, there was this hiccup with the bold lab, you yes. know. Yes, that first well, you know. genetic testing. Um, but then this desperate call came out from Lloyd in July 2002, that he was running out of funds and couldn't carry on yeah. and it reached quite a bad moment in the project as, yes. as we said yeah yeah and so i thought well you know now he's put this call out in july t 2002 um the millions around the world who are fascinated by this and some of them must have more than a bob or two to expend on, on um, well, we advancing the frontiers of knowledge basically yes uh, would be willing to chip in so i could you know stay quiet and watch that unfold so and a few more weeks and months went by, and then another rather plaintive call came out in October 2002 yeah. that it hadn't, the, the first call hadn't brought in any yes. results. And mm -hmm. if uh, nothing came through this time, this was the last call, and by Christmas the project would have to wrap up. Yeah. So at that point, yeah, I tragic. emailed him. Brilliant. And I couldn't let this project go down. I mean, this is the most important project of the 21st century, for me, anyway. Well, I, th I think so. I can't think of anything. Now, I know there's, the, there's this sort of the macro scientific take on all of this extraterrestrial contact, um, you know, with the UFOs whizzing around and SETI listening yeah. forever into the <laughs> deep galaxies and not picking up a squeak from out there. <laughs> and, and then this is the micro, you know, very yes. often in small things, the greatest breakthroughs happen. And this little skull picked up by somebody in the 1930s, kept all her life lovingly, you know, coated in shellac, put in a box in her attic. And then when she's reaching the end of her life, she feels a responsibility to do something with it, passes it on to people who are interested in, uh, all, you know, anomalous um, bio relics, if you like. Um, and then eventually it lands on Lloyd's desk. This, this was just totally fascinating because to yeah. me this was the key. Yes. You know? And this is why this project is so important because in a very... Very understated, very modest, very sort of beneath the radar sort of way. It opens up the yes. Pandora's box of I think so. the whole of mm. what's out there in the universe that we are just not looking at, and which has obviously a great interest in us. We have great need to be connected yeah. with all of them. If you look up, we can't see many stars tonight, but you know they're all yeah. up there. Um, there's probably life, teeming life all over the universe and we are enclosed in our little box and I say it's a box with mm. meaning on this planet with you know a box around our brains not looking up, mm. not asking questions, not looking beyond, not asking where we came from what other yes. forms of life are here with us Indeed. and here's yeah. the remains of a form of life which is seriously interesting, seriously alternative and needs investigation and you know when I, I operate from the intuitive level so I think the intuition is rather like the, the scout in a sort of military operation goes out ahead and sort of That's a really out, good way to think plots about out it, where, yeah. where the you know the other yeah. side are coming from and where yeah. things are at. And then comes back, reports back to the big generals, <laughs> and then the real intelligence goes into operation. Yeah. Now, yeah. the scout having come back and reported there's something out there, the yeah. intelligence, which is the scientific community, should be going to work on this. So why aren't they? Well, they're not because change paradigms forever won't you, it you know we're stuck in a groove here we're stuck in a box and you know whatever mm. you call it so it has to be the labors of one 
dedicated man who I completely admire for his dedication over so many years and through so many setbacks and through so much, you know, quite strong hostility and ridicule yes. that he's received and he's weathered all of that and he's kept his nose to the grindstone and he's focused and he certainly won't, you know, look at anything which might distract him because he's got to keep on yes. and on and on and that is the quality that Lloyd has. It's and we're almost good. nearly there, aren't we? I mean, I feel that very, very near. this year, my gosh, it, it, if the funding well, comes through, it, it could, could be. Every time I hear Lloyd, there's something new, but this year yeah. there's something seriously new come up. And I know that it's it's nearly the tipping point. So well, I think it's really very exciting. exciting now. Well, um, especially with the work that Amash does. I mean, yes. we speak to experiences mm -hmm. all the time, and mm -hmm. you know, serious researchers doing extraordinary mm -hmm. work like mm -hmm. Lloyd, and mm -hmm. you know, your great activism. It's fantastic, mm -hmm. and it's part of the evidence. You know, I always cite it as as, as evidence, and uh, you know, you've got to be willing mm -hmm. to at least look at it mm -hmm. and not rely on well, that's right. you see <laughs> so. what are human beings if we're not curious and want to know more you know I was always a curious child and I could never accept that we were just um, cousins of the apes <laughs> you know how could we in a few hundred thousand years develop all these faculties and you know the, the art the music the or the science as it was yes as it was I say with meaning <laughs> um, and all the things that human beings are into and can do the creativity we saw it in the Olympics this summer yeah, yes. huge yeah. creativity. Yes, yeah. Whether you like it or not, I mean, there's certainly a huge urge to be creative in human beings. And I think this is matched by our curiosity, except that it is not encouraged by the powers that be. No, that's not. Now, I hope that this project and the huge interest it's generated around the world is going to reverse that. And yes. Start uh, people really looking. Cause the star child skull is not the only one, as Lloyd mentioned, the, the cone heads and... Yes, we did, we did mention the... Looking around the, in the museums in yes. Mexico and Peru and other places. Yes. And being dug up out of the ground in Africa and China and places like that. You know, we've, we've just begun, but if we can get the star child through and onto yes. the mainstream well, radar... Come so far now. Come yeah. so far. Yeah. And I, it really does feel like we're just on the edge mm -hmm. of the final part, mm -hmm. because yeah. we're just about there. Yeah. That's it. Is That's there anything else you'd like to uh, tell no. us about the Star Child or your feelings when it does come through? What you think that might mean for humanity? Well, a certain sort of satisfaction that you know, I had a sort of personal role to play in it. But um, really, to me, the whole thing is going to change. My role, even Lloyd's role, will be insignificant because the whole thing will bowl along by its own momentum after that. And yes. You know, and we'll finally know the truth. We will know We've the truth. We've got rallies. Yeah, that's right. And then, it's, <laughs> then it's to get to know them. Yes. And to ask them, well, look, you know, we've been through this path before. We've got a few problems here on planet Earth. <clears throat> what did you do? What do you suggest? You know, we're, we're not going to necessarily take your advice, but yeah. <laughs> maybe you could um, perhaps tell us how you cope with the same situation. Yeah. Um, Why know, not? We, Why not? You know, what's the use of being a family, a galactic? family if you're not in touch yeah. with your relatives. So. Well that's lovely, well I can't wait. We're going to have uh, Lloyd back in for some closing thoughts and comments and uh, thanks Belinda, that's All absolutely right. great. And here. thanks for your lovely work. Lovely to be here, I happen to be here. So. <laughs> Let me take your mic sweetie. Yep. So we're back with Lloyd Pye and we want to hear some of his work about some of his work and we want to hear where he wants this all to go. Lloyd, tell us your conclusions about what you see the geneticist work taking you. Well, I'm sure that the geneticist work will take us to a complete recovery of the, of the star child genome and when it can be compared to a human genome, it will probably be in the range of 75% difference. This is our estimate right wow, now. That's huge. And, and uh, when you consider that a chimp is 3% different, a yeah. gorilla is 5% different, a mouse is 70%, a rat is, I mean, yeah. uh, excuse me, a rat is 70%, a mouse is 65 yeast is about 20%. Everything sort of blended in. So, yeah. so the star Amazing. child, if it comes in around 70, 75, 80%, it's still so radically different. It is. That it's, there's no way to say that it's a human. People say to me, well, how are you going to know you have an alien if you don't have an alien to compare it to? We're going to establish the exactly. template for what alien is supposed to be. Can you imagine? I mean, just let's say we've, we've got to the point where it's out there in the public. How do you think that's going to change things? Can you visualize that? I'm going to have to have a complete facial reconstruction <laughs> so I can hide and live, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's one thing I'm sure of. <laughs> it's going to change, you know, our lives dramatically. Those of us who are involved wild. in it, you know, closely, and then for everybody else, I think the great thing about it is it's going to allow us to take the next step in our journey as a species yeah. because I believe that they're out there and they're out there in multiples. It's not just one particular kind. No. But I think that right now they view us as toddlers crawling around with dirty diapers as far as maturity goes. Ew. Because, you know, a kid, they, they run up against something they don't want to deal with. You mean, just, they do like this and like their wor the world goes away. Yeah. That's kind of how we are relative to them. I agree. So until we're to the point where we acknowledge their existence, why would they announce themselves to mm. us if we can't even emotionally yeah. bring ourselves to the point of saying, well, we know you're out there. Uh, some of yeah. us do that, we, yeah. you know, but we're a very small minority. Mm. We've got to get the whole of the planet in a position of saying, we know you're out there. And then maybe they will come down and maybe they will say, okay, you have problems with your oil. Here's what you need to do to have an energy source. Sure. You, you, know, you have problems with pollution. Here's what you need to do to clear mm -hmm. things up. When we get to a certain point, they might come and help us. But until we show a level of maturity, that begins with just simple acceptance. That isn't going to happen, yeah, in my opinion. Sure. So I think what the Star Child provides is that, that really good, firm kick in the rear that we need <laughs> to move us to the next yeah. step of acceptance. And when that happens, then I think you know very good things could happen yeah. in terms of our relationship with those yeah. who are out there. And from the really solid science that it will be, which is fantastic, because we, need, we do need the evidence. And uh, you know, for our general education to, to wake up the rest of the people who still think this is nonsense, how amazing, we do, we do need that. But well, and, and another thing that could come out of it is, is some, some uh, biotech research, yeah. like, for example, the hard bone of the star child. Yeah. If we could learn the genetics of that, what causes that, we could maybe create a therapy for people so that their bones wouldn't go bad when they get old. Yeah, and I mean, I, cer I certainly could use that, yeah, and I would, uh, I would like that. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and great if you thought. could get just a few percentage points of increase in the strength of human bone off the research of that, it would be all worth it mm. right there. Yeah. Just one thing. Yeah. And you could have a lot more than that. Yeah. In your. In your um Nearly 14 years of research now, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Have you, sort of going on the slightly esoteric or perhaps metaphysical side now, have you had any um, phenomena or anomalous events or circumstances around your research happen? No, or not, not that I'm aware of. No. No, no, no phone calls in the middle of the night, no, no threats. So this is really no solid, men, men, men grounded. Yep. <laughs> I mean, but that's great. That, that's it's great. Just yeah. a, I, for whatever mm. reason, I'm being given a pass to do this. Yeah. I understand that I could be stopped or could have been stopped at yeah. anywhere along the way. And frankly, in the beginning, I thought that I would be stopped. Right. So the fact that I have not been stopped leads me to believe that there is some some reason for me to proceed with it. Sure. And I think that it's, it's uh, a kind of a, it provides a middle step because yeah. If if a UFO were to land on the White House lawn or were to hover over yeah. the Olympics or anything like that, yeah. that is a dramatic and traumatic change sure. for everybody. Mm -hmm. But the Star Child provides a way for those of us who look to the future and want to live in the future and are concerned about mm -hmm. the future to say, okay, aliens are real. Yeah. But for those who are very conservative and want to live in the past and keep things the way they are, were in the past. Mm. I think things were better when I was a boy, and I want them to be that way. You know, that, those those kind of people. Yeah. Um, they are are able to say, well, all right, then you had one nine hundred years ago, but by God, that doesn't mean you have them now. You know, those kind of people. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so it it allows for that split to be there, and it's a transitory stage, mm. right? I think it's so exciting. I think it, it is just going to blow the lid of so much to do with our heritage, it's going to our history, a lot of things, I and think. our potential. Yes. Yes. I just think about that extra 200 square cubic or cubic uh, centimeters of, of brain. I mean, just what you could do with that. Right. I mean, yeah. wow. Little, Let alone this, more the, brain, yeah. the cone heads. Yeah. But anyway, that's for another time. Lloyd, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. But please tell us about your books. I know you've got one or two books and your website. Okay, the, the website is start, www.starchildproject.com. Starchildproject.com, all one word. And I have a couple of uh, books about uh, e-books e and things that people would be interested in. Star Child Skull Essentials is an e-book, and Intervention Theory Essentials is an e-book. 
There's a book called The Star Child Skull, which is a book book which goes into the backstory and talks about right, Belinda yeah. and yeah. You know, goes over how things started and how we got up to 207. And um, there's a lot of essays and things on the website. Uh, there's a new abstract by the geneticist on the website that's oh, very impressive, hard to mm. read, but very impressive because, you know, it's in scientific language. So we can send our scientist friends there. Exactly. Great, And, and great we've stuff. already had some positive response for, from some who have been sent there. So we're very excited. Brilliant. So on the um, on the funding side, where, where are you at now, just to wrap up? Well, yeah, pretty up. much zero. We, we, yeah, we okay. either want the whole thing. We're not, we're not in the business of trying to just collect, collect, collect. Right. We're looking for the right person who sees this the way we do. We right. want to we want to stand on the stage of world history with the right kind of person if we can get it. And that's sure. what we're looking for and holding out for. Someone of means, but also of curiosity and of courage and, and not, you know, not just tr wait forever to try to get it in dribs and drabs. That person is out there. And when that person hears the message, they'll come forward and they'll contact so me. Talking just just off camera before that it was about was it three million to to, to do all the testing because just of the extensive the testing, testing yeah. and then four million uh, do, we're talking about dollars to do two programmed documentaries. Well, and, and understand that these documentary um, films gonna... are going to be extremely good quality documentary films mm -hmm. with extremely good graphics to make the, all the DNA understandable yeah. to absolutely uh, someone without any understanding of it at yeah. all. And, and that requires money. But, but to do it, when we do those two films, they will probably be two of the most popular documentary films well, ever made. So we're very excited about this potential. Most important documentaries in, on the planet. Yeah. For so while, one, anyway. yeah, sure thing. One more time, your website. Starchildproject.com, and you can the the ebooks to look for are Star Child Skull Essentials and okay. Intervention Theory Essentials, or the book that you're able to get is just the Star Child Skull. Okay, and I know you just to finish off, you wrote a book called Everything You Know Is Wrong. Well, Everything so. You Know Is Wrong is an older <laughs> book about, okay. but it's about intervention theory, just like the Intervention All Theory right. Essentials. But yes, everything. All right, wrong. thank you very much again. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jan. Really, it's been absolutely a pleasure. Thank I think it's really. fantastic. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Because yeah. without you, we wouldn't be making this bold step forward, pushing that envelope. And another extraordinary and that interview. Thank you very much, everybody, for everything. Miles, brilliant, wonderful lighting. Archaeologists, anthrop well, anthropologists, not archaeologists, hmm. anthropologists, people who should know right. what they're looking at okay. and, and didn't. You know, okay. So that I was by the end of the year, I was convinced that right. it was something very special. So which year are we in at the moment? 99, then? early. Early 99. I saw it in early 99, okay. and by the end of 99, I was pretty much convinced of what it was. And so how did it come to be in your custody? Well, Ray and Melanie, they both had jobs, and they couldn't do anything with it. Right. And so they said, as you travel around, I was traveling around the country yeah. giving lectures. They said, as you travel around, would you just try to find out what it is yeah. from experts where you go? And I said, yeah, I will. And so I did. Yeah, Great stuff. And I have to say that um, I think we were saying it was about four years ago that you were in the UK, and I attended one of your lectures. And um, indeed, you had the two facsimile skulls. Right. And uh, I know that you have the precious ones locked away in, right. a, in a bank vault, don't you? Yeah. But what was really interesting about that is um, whilst they, they didn't look sort of hugely different in terms of size, I mean, some difference, but it was the weight. Right. That was the phenomenal Actually, thing. Actually, they're, they're about physically the same size. Yeah. They're the size of a skull of, a, of about a five-foot human or... The Amash Project.
Good evening. We are here in Highgate for an extraordinary Amash Researchers Report. We're here catching Lloyd Pye. Thank goodness he's just in the UK for a week. Now, a month, a month. So right. he's got right. some conferences going, so I hope you see those. Anyway, I've heard that today is a very auspicious time. We have got Uranus conjunct the moon with Aries rising, or in Aries rising, I should say. So this means something special. So, Lloyd, thanks for being with us, taking the time out. Well, it's special just to be here with you. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Okay, well, we're here to talk about the Star Child. Right. And the Star Child, for those people who don't know, is a skull, a real bone skull. Right. Perhaps you can fill us in on the very first history of it, the, the beginnings. The Star Child skull was found in about 1930 in Mexico uh -huh. by a young girl, teenage girl at the time. And she found it in a mine tunnel with another, there were two skeletons of which the Star Child was the head of one and a human, normal human was the head of the other. She recovered the two skulls brought them back, kept them her whole life, assuming as anybody would in 1930 that the, the what she called the strange or bizarre looking one was uh, just a human deformity. And then they, they ended up giving the, when she was dying, she gave it to some friends to keep. They kept it for five years and gave it to some other friends. So just to go on a time frame, so how long did she have the skulls for not From knowing they were? about 1930 to about 1993 okay, or four so, when she died. So quite a time. Exactly. And then um, the, the couple that ended up with it, Ray and Melanie Young, uh -huh. Melanie was a neonatal nurse for about 15 years. And when she saw the skull itself and held it, much too light and uh, about a 12 year old average yeah. person. Yeah. And and also I I think you were saying there was something to do with the volume the capacity right. of the brain in this other skull right. let's say. Um, in in the human skull of that size mm -hmm. it, like as you and I sit here mm -hmm. we have about 1400 cubic centimeters of brain in our heads an average person has about 1400 cubic right. centimeters. A very small person, around five feet tall, is going to have more like 1,200 cubic centimeters. Right. It's just a size thing. The star child is the size of a, a head that should have should have 1,200 cubic centimeters. The human that it was found with, she does have 1,200 cubic centimeters. But the star child, when you measure its brain volume the same way, you turn it upside down, you pour seed, bird seed in, mm -hmm. and pour it out and measure yeah. the amount, it's one third more. Wow, it's I mean, that's 1, huge. 1,600 cubic centimeters. Wow. It's 200 more than you and me. Yeah. From 1,200 to 1,600 is a huge jump in the same capacity. So when that was done, the brain guy was like, I don't know how this happened. Yeah. I don't know how this could happen. Yeah. Well, some of the ways where the extra um, would come is that it's much too symmetrical. And she could see that all of the physical features that she could just see were not human-like. Just the, the most basic things, the eye sockets were different, the brow ridges were different, the nose was different, the ears were in a different position. It was missing an any, and just everything she could see, it had a crease in the top of the head. Yes. Everything told her it wasn't a human deformity and it wasn't a human skull. It was just too symmetrical, too different, too light. Everything about it was wrong in terms of human. You've been involved in hominoid research, hominid research, no, I should hominoid. say. No, uh, hominoid. Hominoid. Right, Bigfoot and the abominable snowman. Yeah. And I had also done a lot of human origins work relative to that. And so when they were asking around about okay. who in the field of alternative knowledge dealt with skulls. My yeah. name came up. They invited me to come to El Paso and take a look. Right. I did. My first reaction was that it probably was a deformity of some kind, but I told them it was very unusual and I didn't know what kind of deformity yes. it might be. And had you seen anything remotely like this no, before? No, I never had. And so I began to take the experts to see what they said, and it turned out they hadn't either. They, right. Nobody and these, really these are was. your usual run of the mill medics, and I don't well, mean that rudely. Really. I mean, be, the, yeah, this would be doctors, and this would be very special. This would right. be anatomists. This would